Hey, if you're ready to study God's word, let me hear you say, I'm ready. Why don't we go ahead and start this off by saying our faith statements together. Join with me. I am deeply loved, highly favored, greatly blessed, totally righteous, and destined to reign because of Jesus. We've been, I don't know what this was. <laughs> Anyway, we've been in this collection of talks titled Kingdom Culture, and we've been working our way through the words that Jesus spoke on his famous sermon titled The Sermon on the Mount. What we've been realizing is we've been realizing the words that Jesus spoke are very different than the words that we hear in our earthly culture. And so what we're going to do is we're going to pray and we're going to study this together, and we're going to have a great time doing it. Let's pray. Jesus, we want to say thank you for everything that you're doing in our lives. Right now, we just ask that you speak to us. I pray that we grab a nugget of truth out of today and we apply it to our lives so that our lives can be transformed, we can have a miracle happen, and we live fully filled lives. We thank you for the joy that comes from you. In your name we pray. All God's people said, Amen. Today I've titled this talk, Enemies of the Kingdom. Now when I say enemies, we immediately start thinking about one person against another person. When we take a look at scripture, we realize that there is an enemy of the kingdom, but it's not people. In Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12, it says this, We are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies. We're not fighting against people but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. There is an enemy, but that enemy is an enemy of the kingdom, and it's these dark forces and these dark authorities in the spiritual world around us that doesn't like the kingdom of heaven very much. Second Corinthians says, Satan who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. So because Satan has blinded the minds of people, sometimes what they do is they attack Christians. But those people are not our enemies. It's the evil one within them that is our true enemy. And so when we study these words today in Matthew chapter 5, the question that I have is this. How do kingdom citizens respond to people influenced by the evil one? Because if we recognize who the enemy really is, we respond differently. And so Matthew chapter 5, 38 through 48 says this. You have heard it was said that an eye for an eye or a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you not to resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other to him also. Now this verse has been quoted many times, but it's often been taken out of context, right? So, you know, my neighbor kicked my dog. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and I'm going to kick their dog because it says an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Or my coworker stole my favorite pen, and so I'm going to go and I'm going to steal their kids, <laughs> right? Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. But what that is, is that's retaliation. And Jesus is saying, don't retaliate, rather absorb the insult. The law of retaliation says to hit someone harder than where they hit you. That's retaliation. But see, if we absorb the insult, we create a window of opportunity for that person who is influenced by evil to actually go and be redeemed by Jesus. Remember, people react in wickedness because of the evil that's working inside of them, and the evil comes from the enemy, and the enemy is Satan, the enemy of the kingdom. Romans chapter 12, 21 says this, Do not be overcome by the evil, but overcome evil by doing good. And so number one, kingdom citizens are radically kind. When it comes to experiencing all sorts of conflict and people who may not like you very much, you know what we are? We are radically kind. But sometimes we're like little kids, right? 
<laughs> we're like, when it comes to kindness, we're like, I don't want to. <laughs> don't make me, right? We throw these little temper tantrums because we don't want to be kind to those who insult us. But if we want to combat evil, we do it by being good. And so kingdom citizens are radically kind. Why are we radically kind? Well, letter A, we are radically kind because our Lord was radically kind. When we take a look in Luke chapter 23, 34, Jesus was hanging on the cross and he said to the crowds who were hurling insults at him, he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That's radical kindness. Letter B, we are radically kind because radical kindness will reach the lost and vengeance won't. At the foot of the cross, there was a Roman centurion who helped nail Jesus to the cross. And in Mark chapter 15, 39, it says this, When the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, Surely this man is the Son of God. There was something different about Jesus that caught his eye. The criminals before him, when they were being crucified, would hurl insults back at the crowds that were insulting them. But Jesus didn't do it. He absorbed the insult. He responded with kindness. And it was the kindness that led this Roman centurion to recognize that Jesus surely was the Son of God. Now, as you follow church history, you read that legend has it that this Roman centurion had dedicated his life to Christ and he had also given up his life for Christ. Why? because of the radical kindness that he saw that day. Matthew chapter 5, 40 through 42, it says this, If anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. In court, what they could do is they could take your shirt, but they couldn't take your coat. And Jesus is saying, nah, you know what? Be generous. Go ahead and give him your coat too. And whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. In that day, Roman soldiers could ask anyone around them to carry their pack or their shield or their sword for one mile legally. And Jesus is saying, you know what? Hey, how about this? How about you be radically generous and you just take it two miles? And then it goes on and says, give to him who asks you and from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. So number two, kingdom citizens are radically generous. And generosity is tied to the heart of God. When we are generous, God opens up a window of opportunity. He opens a window of blessing. He opens up a window of anointing like never before because generosity is tied directly to the heart of God. But you know, if we're honest, here's the deal. We're not born generous. When you walk into a room of kids who are playing with toys and you've got that one little boy who's playing with his trucks and he's like smashing them against each other and then another boy sees how much fun he's having with that toy and he goes over and he tries to grab one of those toys out of that little boy's hand, what does that boy do? He looks at the boy who's trying to grab his toy and he says, mine. <laughs> That's not a very generous answer at all, right? This is mine. Why? Because we're not born generous. We're born into earthly culture, and earthly culture is not naturally generous. It's when we begin to see the heart of God that we realize that that should be our heart as well, and we begin the journey of generosity. Why should we be so generous? Well, here we go. Letter A, we are radically generous because our God is radically generous towards us. In the Bible, there are 7,000 promises of God. 7,000 blank checks with your name on it ready to cash out. He's, God's just waiting for you to do it. And basically what it is, is for every promise, there's a premise. And God is saying, well, if you do this, I'll do that. For every promise, there's a premise. There are more promises related to generosity than any other subject in the Bible. So what is it about generosity? And why is it so closely tied to God's heart? Generosity is this. Generosity is love in action. It's love in action. You can give without loving, but you can't love without giving. In John chapter 3, verse 16, 
It says that God so loved the world that he gave. First, love. Then he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Generosity is love in action. Look at the action that God took. He gave his son for you and I. His father's heart gave up his own son to die for you and I so that we didn't have to be trapped in our sin, but we could experience freedom and also eternity in heaven. That's generosity. Letter B, radical generosity can reach the lost. Hoarding and selfishness will not. My wife and I often watch a show on TLC called Hoarding Buried Alive. And a lot of times we, we watch it and we're just like, how does that happen? I don't, I don't understand, right? And I know there's a lot of things that play into that, but we, we just always come back to, I don't know how that happens. And I started thinking about this a little bit, that, that radical generosity can reach the lost, but hoarding and selfishness won't reach the lost. You see, God has gifted us with different skill sets. And he doesn't want us to hoard those skill sets. He wants us to put love in action. He wants us to give away to others. Look at it like this. Look at it like this. Let's say the only people I preached to were, were, were who I saw in the mirror every day, right? Let's say I only preached to myself every single day. What good that does that do for anybody else? No good at all. That would be hoarding that gift that God gave me. But because we've given it away over and over and over again, we've seen many, many people cross the line of faith and follow Jesus. So radical generosity will reach the lost. What is it that God has given you that maybe you've been hoarding that you just need to simply give away? God's kids generously give to advance the gospel. That's what it's all about. Every time we give for the advancement of the gospel, it's worth everything we give. Our time, our resources, our money, you name it. If it's for the advancement of the gospel, it goes on for eternity, and people find and follow Jesus. Matthew chapter 5, 43 through 46, it says, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. What? Bless those who curse you. No way. Do good to those who hate you. These are definitely not earthly culture principles. But Jesus is saying this, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that they may be sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do also? That is insane that Jesus is saying, we're not going to hate our enemies. We're going to love them. Number three, kingdom citizens are radical lovers. We love our enemies. Why? Because our enemies are not people. Our enemy is the one working through people. When there's an evil person or a wicked person, it's because the devil is working in and through them in one way or another. And Jesus is saying, if we love them, maybe we can love that out of them. We bless and we don't curse. We do good when people hate us. And we pray for those who persecute us. But why do we do those things? Well, letter A, we radically love because the Lord radically loved. Jesus loved his enemies. Jesus blessed and he didn't curse. Jesus did good when people hated him. And he prayed for those who persecuted him. Romans 5, 8 says this, God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 1 John 3.16 says, This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid his life down for us. That's radical love. And man alive, wouldn't the world look different 
if we practice that one concept of scripture where we just radically love people. We ripped out all the hate, all the animosity, and we just loved people. Letter B, we radically love because radical love can reach the lost like nothing else will. People watch and they take note how Christians react and respond to situations. And I'm letting you know right now that if we have radical love in our hearts, we will reach the lost because people will recognize that it's beyond ourselves when someone says they hate us, but we love them in return. When someone does wrong to us, but we pray for them instead of do wrong to them, people will recognize that and they'll say there's something different about them because they're reacting and responding beyond themselves. Why? Because we're, we're reacting and responding according to the love of God. 2 Corinthians 5.14 says, For the love of Christ compels us. 2 Peter 3.9 says, God in long, is, is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You see, he's saying we want to keep the windows open to those who do wrong to us because we, God doesn't want anyone to perish. Matthew chapter 5.48 says, Therefore, you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. That word perfect means mature. And so number four, Kingdom citizens are radically transformed from the inside out. Every single day, we're becoming more and more like God. We're maturing into the people that he desires us to be. Well, how can we do that? How, 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 do, how do we transform? Letter A, we have the gift of righteousness. Romans 5.17 says, how much, will those, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in the life through one man, Jesus Christ? Remember, Jesus wants us to bring all of our imperfections, all of our sin, to him. He nailed it to the cross. And in return, he gives us his perfection, the medal of righteousness. And let her be, we have the gift of the Holy Spirit every day, everywhere we go. Galatians 5, 22 through 23, it says, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. We're transformed by all of those things. And I want to go back to something that I mentioned way back in January. What if, what if we as believers just started to live the fruit of the Spirit every single day? What if, what if people on our planet just applied love, joy, peace, goodness, kindness, gentleness? What if they faithfulness and self care? What if we all just applied that to our lives? This world would look so different. And then I realized one day we will experience a world just like that, but it's not this world, it's the next one. It's where we go after we die. If we're following Jesus, we will step into a glorious heaven where everyone will be living out the fruit of the Spirit perfectly. And oh man, is that going to be exciting or what? We are changed. We're different. We're transformed. We become more and more like Jesus every single day. So my question today is this. Are you ready? Are you ready to experience heaven? Maybe some of you today have never given your lives to Christ and you're like, I'm going to do that today because I want, to, I want to step into a world with all of these amazing things for me. And I want to experience the, the presence of God like I've never experienced. I want to spend eternity with him. If that's you, just respond by saying something like this. Jesus, right now I give you my life. I declare you as Lord. I ask for you to come in and forgive me of my sin. I give you my heart. I know that you came. I know that you died. I know that you rose again. And someday you're coming back. In your name we pray. Amen. Hey, why don't we go ahead and close this up by saying our blessing verse together. Join with me, Psalms chapter 67, verses 1 and 2. God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine upon us that his way may be known on earth, his saving power among all nations. God bless. We'll see you next time.